Great. So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, Green Week session on the new EU biodiversity strategy targets for protected areas. Um, I'd like to start maybe by briefly introducing myself. So my name is Natalie Powells, and I am uh, currently working as the deputy head of cabinet to the commissioner responsible for uh, crisis management, which is actually humanitarian aid and civil protection. And you may wonder then why I'm here moderating this session uh, of Green Week on biodiversity. Um, and that is partly because I, I actually worked on these issues in the past. I spent 14 years uh, working in DG environment, including on issues relating to nature and biodiversity. And I was also involved in uh, drafting the last biodiversity strategy, um, which has now been, been um, updated and, and replaced uh, by, by the current strategy. Um, so I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, I say that I'm, I'm now working on crisis management, but in many ways, uh, I spent years working on crisis management from my perspective. Um, when we see the latest State of Nature report, uh, the State of Nature in the EU, which was published on the 15th of October, I think we can only uh, call this uh, another crisis, a biodiversity crisis. Uh, we were talking about that already 10 years ago and things have not gotten better. Uh, and I think that uh, the need for uh, a strategy and for for a lot of very strong, uh, committed action to tackle this crisis is needed more than ever, uh, more than ever than before. So, um, so I think uh, this session is a, a very pertinent one, and uh, we'll be exploring, in particular, the role of protected areas as part of this strategy. Um, we have uh, several speakers today. Uh, we have Katarina Bukowska, who um, is the Director General for the Directorate for Nature, Biodiversity and Landscape Protection in the Ministry of Environment of the Slovak Republic. Uh, she also has uh, previous experience here in Brussels representing Slovakia uh, as Environment Councillor, so she knows how, how things work here in Brussels and is very familiar with uh, the many issues that we'll be discussing uh, today, also from that perspective. We have Helen Koch, who is uh, working with the uh, Confederation of European Forest Owners. Uh, she's a policy advisor. Uh, she's been working with them since early 2018. Uh, and prior to that, she also spent some time in DG Environment working on forest related issues. And she is a forester by training. We then have Alberto Arroyo Stel, who works as a senior policy manager for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's European Regional Office in Brussels. And he's been working on uh, European environment policy issues for two decades now. So I think uh, all of these speakers will be able to give us very interesting, but also different perspectives on the topic that we're discussing uh, today. Um, but we're going to start, but before we start actually with a presentation that's going to be given by Nicola, Nicola Notaro, who's the head of the Nature Protection Unit in DG Environment, I'd like to just mention a couple of, of things um, relating in a way to the, the session and how it will, will work and your role as participants. Um, so first of all, um, you can enlarge the screen. Uh, you'll see that you can enlarge the screen by clicking a button at the bottom of the stage screen. So that way you, you see us very well, hopefully. You can also submit questions, which we would really encourage you to do, by pressing on the question mark on the bottom right hand of the screen. So once we have heard from all the, the panelists, um, I'll be opening up to questions and, and you're more than welcome to submit those questions. Um, I think you can do that at any time. But also very importantly, if you take the floor at any point, I mean, this is more for our speakers, but uh, our speakers, once they have spoken, uh, we would uh, appreciate it if they could then click again on the mute button so that we don't have too much uh, interference of noise when others are speaking. Sorry for all of these technicalities and welcome to the world of online events, which I think we're all getting used to now. Um, but still, it's always a bit of an adjustment and rather different from seeing each other in person on it live. Um, on stage as it was in the past. So um, I think without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Nicola, who's going to take us through a short presentation on the new uh, biodiversity strategy targets on protected areas. So Nicola, over to you, thanks. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Natalie. And uh, 
indeed i'm going to move on to the presentation that uh, i hope you can already uh, see on screen and um, uh, the subject of the presentation is going to be uh, of course the targets on protected areas that uh, the european commission has put forward in the biodiversity strategy adopted um, last uh, 20 for may and uh, in particular the criteria for additional designations to achieve this target uh, that um, uh, we have just um, uh, put forward in fact in a uh, technical note aimed at providing guidance uh, to member states, which was published only last uh, last Friday. It's of course uh, really hot from the oven, and uh, it is our first attempt to spark a discussion on this issue. And we will have plenty of opportunity to discuss it. Indeed, uh, uh, in particular, in the uh, uh, expert group that uh, um, puts together stakeholders and member states representative, the so-called NADEG that will meet uh, later this week. I'm very happy to see there's a great participation this morning. And so I go straight into the substance of um, uh, the document. Uh, I shall recall that the target is the achievement of 30% of protected areas on EU land and 30% on the sea. And one third of this should be uh, under strict protection according to the Commission proposal. Now, uh, the idea is, of course, that uh, these uh, protected areas form a very coherent uh, network uh, which goes beyond borders, so a trans-European network. But obviously, we're not interested in paper parks, so we want to see clear conservation objectives and measures and management plans that uh, help achieve uh, clear conservation results. Now, this, of course, uh, can only be achieved if there is appropriate monitoring of these areas, uh, if there are human resources, if there are financial resources that are uh, provided. And in the um, uh, strategy, we committed to uh, develop uh, criteria and guidance to help member states achieve this target, which hopefully the Environment Council will endorse uh, uh, in a couple of days. And um, uh, we uh, therefore committed to develop a document by the end of this year. This is what we have done. And hopefully by the end of next year, we will have found an agreement. Um, now, the first priority in our view is really to fill in the gaps in Natura 2000 because, uh, of course, particularly uh, for the marine part, we think that uh, there are margins for the network to expand considerably. Actually, we expect that it will still double in the marine uh, environment. So there are quite a lot of uh, new designation uh, which we uh, inspect as required under the directives, the Habitats and Birds Directive. Um, now of course, um, uh, again, the conservation objectives and measures will be essential to make sure that these uh, protected areas are effective in achieving the targets of the biodiversity uh, strategy. But um, the target is not going to be achieved only through Natura 2000. And in fact, it's a combination of nationally designated areas and Natura 2000. Member states have designated uh, a number of protected areas, which, uh, especially national parks, which are not included, uh, not part of Natura 2000, but they are complementary to it. And they reported to the uh, Environment Agency in a database which is uh, uh, called the CDDA. And um, if we want to make sure that altogether Natura 2000 and these nationally protected areas achieve a coherent result, we need to screen them to see that um, actually they abide by the same or similar criteria. And that's why we, we think it would be necessary uh, for the member states to look at these nationally designated protected areas, assess uh, their effectiveness against criteria that we are discussing and um, uh, improve the situation where, uh, where necessary. Um, now, um, I said uh, the, the starting um, uh, block is really Natura 2000, of course, because so much have been, has been done by the member states and invested by them and stakeholders in this uh, respect. Then, in addition, we expect uh, uh, protected areas under national schemes. And then there will be newly designated areas. Why newly designated areas? Because currently our baseline is around 26% of protected land and uh, around 11% um, uh, of protected sea. Therefore, it's quite clear that if we want to achieve the 30% target, we need to complete the network both on land and sea. And the effort, of course, is much more significant uh, at sea, at least in uh, quantitative terms. Now, what do we expect member states to do for the new protected areas? Well, essentially, 
um, start by uh, prioritizing areas that contribute to the coherence and connectivity of Natura 2000. Uh, so while there may be the, the network may be already sufficient in terms of covering the habitats and species as required by the nature directives, uh, there could still be margins to designate additional areas, buffer zones, uh, that uh, ecological corridors that help ensuring coherence and connectivity of Natura 2000 sites. Uh, so we think that this should be part of the analysis to be conducted uh, in each and every uh, member states. Um, then we would expect that uh, member states identify species and habitats that um, may require new protected areas. And uh, of course, there are different possible sources uh, for this. One could decide to designate uh, new areas for habitats or species which are already in the annexes of the nature directive, simply expanding the coverage. Uh, but also one could think of um, uh, covering other species and habitats which are not covered uh, by the nature directive, especially those which have been identified by European level red lists. And we would certainly encourage member states to make um, uh, the most use the best use of these existing um, tools. Um, this is at, uh, at the EU um, uh, level, if you like, but uh, then um, uh, member states should, um, after having identified the habitat and species that need further designations, of course, they should identify the best areas for those habitats and species. And here again, we have criteria, which uh, can be a reference and a lot of technical and scientific work which has taken place through the identification of key biodiversity areas uh, and also the important uh, bird areas, the KBAs and the IBAs. So it would be certainly possible to use that work and without uh, reinventing the wheel uh, in order to identify the areas that uh, could be designated to cover the habitats and species that uh, each member state has decided to, uh, to protect further. Um, now, a similar exercise uh, can be done uh, at national and regional uh, level on the basis of national or um, local uh, red list. And, um, and therefore, it would also be possible, uh, instead of using only the European list, European red list, or annexes of um, nature directive lists, it would also be possible for the member states uh, to identify uh, species and habitats on the basis of the uh, national and regional red list. So, if you like, we see really two steps. Um, uh, in order to uh, identify the newly designated areas. One would be looking at uh, a list of species uh, and habitats uh, uh, at European level from Red List and Nature Directives. And another one will be uh, looking at um, uh, the national or regional level, uh, looking at national list, list national uh, red, uh, red lists. I move on and um, I want to underline that there is a quite significant linkage between this target on protected areas and um, uh, other targets which are um, proposed in the biodiversity strategy and which concern uh, restoration. The Commission is working on the development of uh, legally binding targets for restoration as mentioned in the restoration plan contained in the biodiversity strategy. And uh, obviously when you restore an area, um, you need to ensure that the restoration effort is not uh, lost or undermined. Therefore, it would be wise to consider including uh, in this expansion of protected areas, the areas that are restored for instance, as a consequence of uh, uh, this restoration plan and uh, legally binding targets that we are planning to propose. Um, we are talking about protected areas. And of course, I give for granted that everyone is aware of the fact that we apply the conventional biological diversity protected area definition uh, to which all um, member states and the European Union committed to. Uh, but also within the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity, there are other concepts for area-based protection. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the so-called OECMs. Uh, these are uh, other area-based conservation measures uh, which um, uh, have also been defined uh, in the framework of the CBD. And therefore, we think they could also uh, play a role in um, the achievement of the 30% target, uh, together with um, uh, areas designated in uh, uh, urban agglomerations or peri-urban um, areas. Uh, why 
why this? Well, of course, this is an element that brings a bit more flexibility in the achievement of the target, but um, also because these are areas that are supposed to achieve some conservation result, even though originally they were not designated for that purpose. It could be, for instance, military areas. It could be areas close to uh, uh, economic activities of fisheries, for instance, in order to ensure replenishment of fish stocks uh, and so on. Um, now, um, while this definition, the OCM definition comes for the international level, we also think it needs to be tailored at EU level. And in that case, uh, we think that in particular is important to ensure legal protection through the OCMs. So this um, element is absolutely essential. It could come from a legal legislative instrument, administrative regulation, contractual means, but it has to be a long-term commitment. There should be a minimum duration, for instance, if it's um, uh, the legal instrument is, is contract, because otherwise the conservation objectives can be quickly undermined. Uh, now, just a few words on uh, strict protection before I uh, come to a close. One third of the 30% targets in the Commission proposal should concern uh, strict protection, should introduce the strict protection of both land and uh, sea, so 10% of each. And um, in our understanding, this means that uh, there are areas where uh, the ecological requirements of the habitats and species that you want to protect uh, require indeed that they are left essentially undisturbed and therefore no human activities that can disturb those uh, uh, features should be uh, taking place. So the activities that are allowed will really depend on the conservation objectives. but. Um, Basically, uh, only non-intrusive activity, mainly non-extractive activities, uh, should be allowed in these uh, in these areas, uh, which should be, of course, of a sufficient size in order to be meaningful for the achievement of the objective. Um, street protection for us is not an end in itself. It has to serve a, a purpose. It's not for areas that need uh, active management, of course, but um, it's for areas that. Um, if I may simplify, should be left alone mainly. And um, this is, in our view, old growth and primary forest, and there is a process ongoing with stakeholders and member states participation to define those contexts, um, but should also be areas which are uh, really a rich carbon uh, ecosystem and uh, or other ecosystem that requires strict protection. There's a strong link also with climate change policy. We would like to uh, uh, contribute through the protected areas target to enhance the mitigation the, 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 the sink effect uh, of, um, uh, of um, our land and our uh, forest in order to help achieve uh, mitigation uh, results. Um, now, of course, I mentioned already the issue of connectivity and ecological corridor, therefore uh, don't need to add uh, much, much to that, but uh, the overall coherence of the network is absolutely essential. Hence, uh, the importance of this discussion that we're really starting today uh, about uh, uh, criteria uh, that could be used across the board, uh, across biogeographical regions, uh, by the member states in cooperation with stakeholders for the additional designations. I think I can leave it at that. Thanks a lot and looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Nicola, uh, for the presentation. I think it covers a lot of, uh, a lot of different issues and and I hope that our speakers will be able to, to pick up on some of them and react in a sense to, to what you've been explaining to us um, and maybe give a perspective, uh, first starting with Katarina Bukowska, who can give us a perspective from, from a, a member state um, who will you know, need to put this into practice and, and see how this uh, can be done uh, at the national level. So um, Katarina, I would uh, invite you now to take the floor. Thank you very much, Natalini, for giving me the floor and uh, good uh, morning, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you for organizing Green Week in, uh, even in this uh, quite uh, strange uh, uh, life we are, we are facing nowadays. And uh, maybe this is really something we, we keep, have to keep in mind. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, something that uh, brings us to, to our idea that uh, our, our our uh, lives are so depending from the nature, from nature, and uh, we are so fragile and our prosperity lives and existence is really strongly related uh, to uh, this uh, 
very sensitive nature, it's, it's uh, uh, links and uh, all these um, really uh, tiny, tiny and uh, uh, difficult difficulties we are facing. So therefore, uh, even more, I'd like to uh, thanks to the Commission that uh, um, successfully completed and published the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 together with the strategy Farm to Fork. And uh, I consider the strategy itself as a very well-structured document uh, which addressing uh, all key issues we have to focus uh, our attention, work and effort in the next period at the national and European but also international level. And uh, I, I really believe that we need ambitious targets to move forward and uh, reach some visible significant progress uh, to change this trajectory uh, in, in biodiversity loss. And in this regard, also, as Nicola mentioned, I believe that uh, on the Friday that or the next days, the, the Council will adopt the Council conclusions to uh, regarding the biodiversity strategy for 2030. Coming um, to, to targets and objectives, we have the key element of uh, today's uh, session. As I mentioned, I think that we really need uh, ambitious uh, targets, but at the same time, I think that we are at the beginning of the discussion that uh, uh, how, to, how to achieve, what kind of criteria uh, should be used, and uh, this is really hard work in front of us. I think that, uh, as Nicola already uh, referred, uh, there are two key elements in the whole strategy regarding targets. The first of all is uh, target 30% of, of for land or the sea. And uh, I um, would like to, to uh, um, really, um, in that point, agree that uh, we should uh, build our our next work on Natura 2000 uh, network, which is already uh, not completely, but uh, I think that reasonably established uh, uh, across uh, the EU. Uh, if we are speaking uh, how to enlarge this, this protected areas to uh, at least 30%, I will focus on, on, on uh, for land and not uh, to the sea as Slovakia is a landlocked country and I don't have such experience regarding uh, sea habitat, uh, then uh, I think that, uh, okay, the bone or the, the, the core uh, Natura 2000 is, is uh, good. Uh, uh, we can uh, find a lot of inspiration regarding uh, criteria or uh, how, to, how to think about the extension of, of these Natura 2000 sites, but at the same time, uh, our expectation uh, or my expectation is that we will not uh, uh, use the whole set of criteria. We will not uh, just uh, extend or enlarge um, um, Natura 2000 uh, in the clear meaning, but we will uh, take the best uh, uh, of uh, experience. And uh, of course, as, uh, as uh, was uh, presented, we will uh, took into account national experience national preferences, priorities, uh, or, or priority habitats or species, they need to be included. I think that uh, member states, they have uh, quite uh, good experience with setting national targets or national criteria. Uh, in many cases, uh, a lot of uh, protected areas, uh, they have a longer history, uh, even than Natura 2000, and I think that this, this uh, knowledge and, and experience uh, can be very helpful uh, to create a really coherent network across uh, across the EU. How to reach the target at the EU level, and of course my expectation will be that it will be fair share among uh, member states, of course taking into account really national conditions, because uh, we know that this will be very different uh, if we are speaking about the biogeographical regions, uh, the conditions uh, are very different from north to south and from east to west, so I think that that's very important. In case of Slovakia, for instance, we, um, we are speaking about the territory, uh, if we are speaking about Natura 2000, we already covered uh, almost 30% of our territory 
uh, which is included in the Natura 2000 network, and uh, if we will take into account uh, other protected areas, they are not part of Natura 2000, uh, we are already speaking about 37% of protected areas in Slovakia. But uh, this is the figure. What is very important, and I would like to um, uh, focus, um, and I, um, Slovakia will focus uh, its, its, uh, its attention and, and work for the next period also to increase and improve uh, the management and the protection of those areas, because the size is one thing, but the, then the quality of, of management and measures uh, that are taking place and they are applied are very important and of course it is linked with uh, to financial sources um, that uh, then uh, then it's the question i was uh, watching also the questions they are coming but yeah so um i think that uh, um, the ambitious is on, on the uh, place, but at the same time, I think the, the very technical discussion is in front of us that how to, how to really uh, take into account uh, the most valuable species habitats and, and uh, increase biodiversity, uh, not uh, only at the national level, but at the EU level as well. So uh, just uh, to give you an idea that uh, even before 19, uh, 2000, uh, 2019, the Slovakia has adopted already um, the strategy Greener and uh, Green uh, Slovakia, Greener Slovakia. This is uh, our environmental strategy for 2030, which includes also the improvement of uh, uh, and uh, improvement of uh, nature and biodiversity protection in Slovakia. And for instance, for us, the national parks are a very important part. We would like to focus and, and really increase either the area, um, non-intervention area, and uh, also the management of national parks. So there are a lot of challenges, including uh, administrative, uh, personal, and organizational in, the sen in this sense. So um, then uh, so coming to uh, to the second point, and I think that is, uh, again, uh, something uh, we need to discuss further, and uh, this is a strict uh, target for strict protection, and as it is said, for one-third of this already mentioned 30% uh, of, of uh, protected areas across the Europe, I think that uh, speaking about uh, this strict protection, we uh, really need to keep in mind what should be uh, the objective of, of this strict protection. I think that in this regard we can uh, um, use the very good document that was uh, recently published, and this is the report from the, com uh, from the Commission and the Parliament of the State of Nature uh, in the EU, in the European Union, and uh, I think that uh, looking uh, to this, uh, we see that uh, some habitats uh, that uh, and they have really highest proportion of bed setters uh, should uh, be uh, also taken into account. I think that the derogation trends uh, are observed in the 25 all, uh, all asset habitats, but I think that uh, as it is, uh, I fully agree, and as it's in the report, that for instance, bulk, myers tines, grasslands, or given habitats uh, have the highest proportion of deterioration trends. And I think that if we are speaking about the strict protection, probably we should also focus on the um, those uh, habitats uh, they are in, very, in a very dangerous uh, you know, status. So because to this we have, of course, linked uh, species and uh, trends in, uh, in uh, species uh, shows the probably the same trajectories. So this, uh, Something I uh, I believe um, it's it's uh, good to discuss and also to to understand uh, what or to to keep in mind what will be our our aim uh, to uh, to have this uh, uh, good quality uh, rich on biodiversity and also providing uh, good uh, ecosystem services or highest uh, highest uh, portion of ecosystem services. Uh, to uh, the um, to the whole network, 
And uh, coming back to, to criteria again, I think that this uh, should be somehow linked to um, to the criteria, uh, as was mentioned, I fully agree that uh, um, probably three uh, key elements uh, should be taken into account. But the, and then, of course, that if all of them or just one of these, this is uh, should be discussed further. We are speaking about quality, quantity, or connectivity. I think that these three elements are really uh, crucial uh, either to reach a 30% target and even uh, we are speaking about the 10 person target. Uh, so um, just uh, probably to conclude, um, yes, uh, I believe that we need to uh, have ambitious um, targets that fair contribution from member states uh, is key element. Of course, next, next technical discussion is needed and uh, we need to discuss for the many definitions, not only we discussed today, probably uh, what is uh, strict uh, protection, but also uh, the question of primary old growth forest, which is ongoing already at the expert level, is, is meaningful, or some other technical and expert discussion uh, I expect in the next year. Uh, addition of new sites uh, should not be taken as a strict extension of Natura 2000, but really uh, we, we need to focus as, uh, as was mentioned by Nicola, by the Commission, that uh, national or even regional set, uh, uh, priorities, uh, habitats or uh, species uh, with, uh, from the red list, uh, for instance, might be included and taken into consideration when we are discussing uh, this uh, methodology or, or um, guide how to, how to reach. And uh, finally, um, speaking about strict protection, I, I think that uh, we have firstly defined what we need to keep under this strict protection. What is really our key um, key goal uh, regarding uh, richness of biodiversity, what we would like to achieve, because really in some areas, biological areas, uh, climax forest might be the, the most appropriate uh, in many areas, but in some areas and in, for some habitats, we will need probably the strict, uh, strictly defined uh, management to keep uh, biodiversity, to keep a uh, uh, certain, uh, certain uh, area in a very good uh, condition or status. So, so I think that this is really beginning. Uh, we need to continue, we need to uh, uh, take uh, into account, of course, the data we have from different monitorings at the EU national uh, level, and that's, uh, I think, a very good starting point for, for uh, next work and uh, setting really good structure and good and uh, really um, to participate actively. Thank you very much for uh, attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Katarina. So we we have heard how how complex this issue is, um, how much work there is still to do, uh, a lot of uh, discussion around definitions and 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 work around strict protection and what this means. Um, I think we already have some questions coming in from participants. Uh, some of them are somewhat linked to this issue. We have questions about how um, how this protection will be ensured. Will there be fines, punishment uh, for those who don't respect um, uh, the strict protection requirements, etc. So I think uh, we can maybe come to those questions towards the end because uh, I'd like to now hand the floor over to Hélène uh, Koch, who is, uh, as I said, the a policy advisor for the Confederation of European Forest Owners. And I think she can give us a perspective also, hopefully, on this issue of uh, primary old growth forests, uh, among, other, among others. So, um, Hélène, please, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you very much for giving CEPF uh, the opportunity to contribute here. So I will give really preliminary comment as a uh, Nicola mentioned, we just got the document uh, late Friday. So that's going to be first key point. So for the time being, I'd like to just highlight three um, important uh, reflection. First, what we are missing, and here I'm teasing you a bit, 
um, then share some reflection on primary and all growth forests. So I hope, uh, Nathalie, that you won't be disappointed. And finally, add some consideration on the reflection on uh, climate change. So uh, to refer to the slide that you're seeing, when we say what we're missing is what is at the core of this slide. We're missing the social component. We're missing the human in the discussion. Obviously, when we speak about a protected area, the ecological criteria are key. But when we speak about designation, then you have people, you have owner that should be uh, thought about. Uh, they are the one that owns the land. They are the one that endorsed the responsibility. You just mentioned, fine. Well, that's going to be landing on them exactly. So they have to be considered. They have to be motivated. They have to be involved in the process. And in that, I would even refer to the presentation of Nicola, who said that protected areas should not be seen in isolation. We do agree they do not, should not be seen in isolation, not just in terms of coherence of the network, but in isolation about the owner of that land and it's really what we're missing in the technical note because while reading the document there is only twice the mention of stakeholder never owners and even in those twice mentioned there are in fact um, just I've mentioned that stakeholder will be consulted on the notes so that's a bit uh, not enough on our side and to explain to you why uh, we are really thinking that this is a key missing point I would like to just look back for a concrete example. The Natura 2000 network, which should also be completed through this uh, process, at the moment, almost 50% uh, are of the site are in forests. And on the bottom right of my slide, you see this nice blue bell in the beach forest, that's a Natura 2000 site habitat. So this is something that as forest sector, we can be really proud, but also that we have some bad memories in the way that the designation process took part then because of the lack of involvement of owners. And this is really something that we would hope to not see repeated to uh, support and endorse better the ownership of this protected area and the ownership of uh, the management that will need to be taken part. So um, we very much welcome the fact that the designation will be done by the member state. We think it's a relevant level, but we do regret the lack of clear reference to the active participation of forest owners from the very beginning, from the every step. And also that they agreed on that, that it should not just be a mapping and designation on a map, but that they should be willing to go and uh, to work to achieve uh, this proper implementation. So that's a bit uh, the key point. It's also uh, the question of funding, which was also mentioned by Katharina. Um, there is a nice list of source of funding, but not so much about how it could be used. Are we speaking about incentive? Are we speaking about compensation? How are they going to be uh, assessed? That's uh, stuff that we would be really uh, looking forward and he to hear more about. But to move to my second point, so to speak about primary forests and old growth forests, and here I'm moving to my left hand side slide where is it an old growth forest? Well, I do not know yet because, as this was mentioned, we are still uh, very much discussing about what does that term actually mean, what does strict protection means. And for that, um, I can uh, happily tell you that Europe and forest owners are actively engaging in the discussion on the working group forest in nature in this uh, old growth forest discussion. But we would like to highlight that this should not limit itself to a Brussels based discussion. Um, all growth forest and the success uh, for, for this protection target should really much uh, be also inclusive of national and regional level. They should not just impl um, include European forest owner representatives such as myself, but they should also include more discussion at national level, regional level, when we'll be discussing about mapping and identification of those forests. So this is really much something that we are looking for in this conjunction with a lower level and to really much avoid to have, again, a top-down approach, but to go for a bottom up with a voluntary commitment of owners. And to move on my third slide, and it's also a bit to say, however, we don't just have concern. There are stuff that we were really happy and really pleased to see in this document. Uh, and I would like to highlight the reference to the importance of resilient ecosystems and um, how they can support climate change. 
for the earth is really a key element to say that even in strictly protected area, management effectiveness includes essential activities such as prevention of forest fire, management of invasive species or disease control. This is key and this should not be overlooked. Uh, and it's also when we speak about old growth forests, to come back at my second point, we should not overestimate their mitigation potential. They have a carbon stock, which is not much evolving. But also we should bear in mind that this carbon stock should not be lost because if we have a major issue or a lack of adaptation to climate change, this might also come into account. So that at the moment, mostly food for thought on this three key point, but and to conclude, I would really like to say, don't forget the people behind the forest. Remember the lesson from the past and keep an eye out for climate change and its impact. And uh, on behalf of CEPF and of European forest owner, we very much look forward to providing more details common and to contribute to this discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Helen, for your comments and uh, very concise remarks uh, and also a very clear conclusion. I think a call uh, to involve stakeholders and I think that's well heard um, and uh, discussions will certainly continue on this issue as we've, we've been hearing. Um, but I'll um, pass right on to Alberto um, for comments from the perspective of IUCN. Um, Alberto, please, you have the floor since we have 20 minutes left. So I think we, we would like to leave enough time to answer some of the questions that have already come in. And, uh, and I would in the meantime, just encourage others. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to, to write. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I will try to keep it short and go to the key points. So first of all, as uh, an environmental organization, as the IUCN, and I think that I can say in, on behalf of the environmental organizations, we all welcome very much the times that we are living with the Green Deal and with the new biodiversity strategy. And this paper, it's, I would say, a step in the right direction also in terms of uh, providing the base of the discussion for how we want to achieve the protected areas target both the 30% and the 10% of street protection. And of course, never forgetting that probably the most important one actually is the management effectiveness. Now, this said, there is a number of discussions about uh, definitions, about how we can exactly achieve some of the targets and what does it mean exactly, for example, strict protection. And here I want to very much emphasize that we have a number of tools already in place, and maybe there is no need to reinvent the wheels especially in, when we have such ambitious targets, 30%, it sounds uh, far away. In Europe, it's a little bit easier, let's say. We are not that far, except for the marine. I will come to that in a moment. But we definitely are far when we think also in the 10% for strict protection. And there, there is a number of, as I said, tools and definitions that are already existing. They are in place for a while, and maybe there is no need to reinvent the wheel. In particular, I'm going to mention here some IUCN tools. I know I'm working for IUCN and I can't avoid that. But I think that it's important to remember that we have these tools in place and they can be very helpful in this discussion. In particular, the categories of management of protected areas of IUCN, they can come in handy when it comes to the definition of a strict protection and when it comes to the implementation, of course, of the target and also the monitoring of how to achieve it. Let's remember that at the moment we are saying that we are in 3% of strict protection in the European Union. Well, this number is based in the IUCN categories 1 and 2. So if we want to get to the 10, which is to triple it, we probably can use also the information that is in these categories to try to get there. There are also other IUCN tools and also not only IUCN tools, also from the CBD definition of protected areas, OECMs, Nicola was mentioning them, that come, come in handy also here. The red list of species and the ecosystems, uh, the criteria of, uh, of reporting and uh, uh, recognizing the OECMs that also Nicola was mentioning. And also for the management, I will also come to this in, in a moment, but there is also a green list standard for IUCN to uh, evaluate and assess the management effectiveness of protected areas. Now, designation of protected areas, uh, we can consider this a little bit of less a priority in Europe, as we are saying all the time, we, the network in the European Union is practically completed. But let's remember all the time that we have a second component, not only the terrestrial, also the marine. 
and the marine is far from being there. We have 10%, which is achieving the IG target. That's good news. But to get to the 30% is to triple the network. That's an incredibly big effort. And there we have to make a very, very strong work during the coming years to focus on the marine area. And let's remember that this is just the designation. After will come the management, which is as challenging or maybe even more challenging. Also here about the designation, I want to mention something that is uh, already written in the report that uh, Nicola presented, that the Commission presented recently, is the famous biogeographic process that was used for the designation of Natura 2000. In a way, I think that what uh, Helen was mentioning about the participation of stakeholders, maybe it's part of it is also hidden here. Uh, it's only written the biogeographic process and we need to define how it will look like. It's a process itself, how to see how it will look like in future. But I hope, I will, I will expect that this process will be as inclusive as possible, more inclusive probably than the previous process, for the designation of further areas, or so more than the designation to control or evaluate how far we are getting into the target. When it comes to the management, and this is, uh, as I said, one of the fundamental issues, uh, we have been failing in the previous biodiversity, the achievement of the previous biodiversity targets. And one of the key reasons has been the implementation, the enforcement and the implementation. Here, I think management is the fundamental issue. And as I said, I mentioned already the green list uh, of uh, IUCN for the uh, and assessing the effectiveness of the management of uh, the protected areas. There is a recent feasibility study, actually, for the application of this criteria for Natura 2000. It can be handy in this context. And again, I think that this is the right moment or the right uh, process to ensure that the stakeholders are involved very much from the beginning. I fully agree with Helen here. For the management, is, there is no doubt that that's the point. Finally, there is also an element of, uh, of the discussion that we can't forget, which is the global component. The EU, with this uh, paper now, starting to start to discuss how we can achieve this 30% target, is setting an example for the global dimension. Next year, we will have the new global biodiversity framework. And also, in principle, we are still discussing about it, but in principle, the 30% target of protected areas will also be there. Well, the Commission or the European Union has already set a little bit of an example with the new biodiversity strategy. Maybe this is also helpful if from the European Union we are setting the lines or the direction how we can achieve this 30% target. Also, let us remember that the European Union has some European territories beyond Europe, which are the outermost regions and the overseas countries and territories. These are somehow nor normally mentioned, but it's good to remember that we have also some good uh, activity and we can again show an example of how to do the things beyond Europe. Now, slowly getting to the end, uh, uh, Catalina was mentioning before the Council conclusions that are coming by the end of this week. Of course, we can only hope that the Member States will embrace this strategy and, uh, and its objectives. These are the real actors. As we are, I was saying, implementation is the key issue and Member States are the key actors. So we need them not only on board, but definitely with the ownership of these targets. So we are looking forward for positive conclusions by the end of this week. And concluding on a positive note, I think it's good to remember that we are living good times for biodiversity. It might sound challenging when we are having a COVID crisis that is making things uh, complicated. Uh, we are having a discussion on a budget that is not that easy. But let's remember that we have a Green Deal that is at the level of the President of the European Commission and the Vice, uh, the ex Executive Vice President is actually the responsible for the Green Deal itself. So at that level, we have something that is called the Green Deal that includes biodiversity strategy. And this is news. This is very different from some years ago, only a few years ago when we have, we still were discussing whether the Birds and Habitats Directive were fit for purpose. Now we know, but now we also have all these positive elements. And I think it's good that we remember that we are having steps in the right direction at the moment. As I said, I, we have these uh, IUCN tools that can help. I'm happy that this is recognized uh, also by the European Commission. We are here to help. And to end, well, we have a long way to go. I think that we can make it. These uh, goals are achievable. I want also to remember that the experts in the World Commission on Protected Areas, they tell us that this 10% of uh, strict protection is achievable by 2030 if we use the categories one and two of IUCN. So we only need the resources and the political will. Let's hope that the next state of the nature that uh, will be presented in seven years will be different than the current one and the previous one that Natalie mentioned that they were not that different. Looking forward to work with all of you to make it happen. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Alberto. And I'm, I'm so happy that you end on a positive note. Um, it is uh, true, I think, uh, those of us working in the institutions, I, I'm, I'm quite sure all agree with your assessment that, uh, that in a way, things have never looked more optimistic uh, for nature, for biodiversity. And I think uh, we need to seize this momentum that we have. Uh, in the sense that there is political will, that this discussion has gone beyond uh, the confines in a way of, of environment policy, uh, and it's really being taken up uh, at the highest political levels. Um, there's strong support for for ambitious nature uh, policy, and I think uh, I think we need to now uh, see how we translate that into really action on the ground and and um, and and starting with things like protected areas, but not only. But um, since we don't have a lot of time left, I thought uh, we could maybe take a quick look through the different questions. We have quite a few and they really range uh, from questions about how stakeholders will be involved uh, in setting targets uh, and also in, in the development of protected areas. Um, we have questions about the unintended consequences of stricter protection in Europe uh, for the rest of the world. We have questions about uh, whether genetic uh, techniques will be used uh, in, in ensuring connectivity. Um, we have, as I already mentioned, questions about fines, about, um, you know, how, how uh, we will make sure that actually um, that protected areas are really protected effectively. Um, and then some more specific questions also about the role of green infrastructure. So I am not sure who would like to begin. Can I um, ask if we have any of our panelists who would like to come in or would Nicola like to start perhaps uh, with some of the questions that are really more geared uh, to you, Nicola? Perhaps we could start that way. Yes, sure. Thanks a lot, Natalie. Uh, well, let me stress that uh, the people are never forget forgotten, uh, in fact, in our work. And uh, the very fact that uh, Ellen is with us today uh, on this panel means that actually the interest of stakeholders and in particular foresters are, are well present for us. But we should not confuse the role of science and then the socioeconomic aspects. And when we identify scientific, technical and ecological criteria for the species habitats and areas to be protected, this is the first step. The socioeconomic is the next step, is when then the member states authority will engage uh, with uh, landowners uh, in order to discuss uh, possibilities of designations and uh, management regimes. And I think we need to keep this distinction very clear. On the question on the involvement of stakeholders, uh, indeed we plan it's in the paper but not in my presentation because I needed to keep the time but of course we need to we plan to develop a biogeographical process uh, in each of uh, the biogeographical regions where member states and stakeholders will be invited to participate and to discuss in fact uh, uh, both the criteria and uh, designation the member states will put forward and um, we do rely on IUCN categories 1a 1b and 2 in terms of the identification of uh, uh, strictly protected areas and uh, we need i think to further discuss these categories and see how they they match the notion of strict protection we put uh, uh, forward um, i don't believe that strict protection in europe can have any negative impact elsewhere simply because elsewhere actually they have much more strict protection than in europe they have much space much more space because europe is such a densely populated area, that this is a notion particularly useful for us. But in fact, in other continents, the areas of strict protection can be much, much larger than what we can afford in uh, in Europe. Um, and I leave it at that as a first reaction to leave space to others. Thanks very much. Um, who else would like to come in? Can I maybe just pass back, uh, I don't know if Hélène, you want to perhaps uh, react to any of the comments here, any of the questions that we've received so far? Uh, well, I must say in terms of the question, uh, we are a bit uh, less um, discussed directly too. So I might just jump back on what uh, Nicola mentioned. Uh, and we strictly, well, we, we fully understand that uh, the ecological criteria is the first step when we discussed about it. But it's very much to be sure that will be involved and will be appropriately involved because here like we are 
looking forward to what the new biogeographical process will be. But in the current biogeographical seminar, there might be a discussion about how well we've been able to be represented uh, and the numbers of seats and so on. But that's much technical approach and I'm sure we'll have time to discuss. But that's um, to be to be included definitely uh, from from our point of view and to looking forward to the next part of the discussion. But that's, I think that's the most I can reply regarding to the chat. So I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Thanks a lot. I see that there's a question specifically for IUCN. Um, and the question is, how does IUCN's protection categories 1B, wilderness, and 2, nature parks, relate to the Commission's proposed definition of strict protection? So, Alberto, do you want to have a go at this uh, question? Replying. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, and thank you for the question. Uh, well, there is a proposal now to consider such categories. I wouldn't say that this is fixed in stone. We are starting the discussion right now. Actually, this paper is only from last Friday. What I will say is that this category, this definition, as I said, it has been discussed during decades with experts. So we have a good base, and I'm happy that we are starting from that uh, point of view. And from this base, it can be very, very helpful. Also, let's remember that the categories are providing also some flexibility. Let's say it's a strict protection. It's, a, it's as strict as we want to say. The strict is stricter if you want, but we can discuss about what it means exactly. And the categories uh, one A, one B, and uh, two can provide some uh, potentially flexibility that can help also in the for the upcome uptake of the stakeholders. That can be very helpful also for ensuring that we have all this uh, ownership that I was saying from the start. So since, since you're um, already on, in a sense, uh, Alberto, uh, there is this question about whether stricter protection in the EU could lead to increased pressure uh, in the rest of the world, given that the global target doesn't include a reference to the strict protection. Um, now, I don't know if you want to comment on this in particular. Um, or uh, yes, Natalie. Yes, uh, I, I I find it an interesting question, and I will I will not say that there is such risk. Europe's, Europe is uh, different from uh, the rest of the world. Uh, we have uh, used very much the territory here, and to ask for uh, some areas with a strict protection doesn't sound like something crazy. On the contrary, I think that is uh, very positive. For the rest of the world, the things are different, and I wouldn't say that there is any such risk. On the contrary, I think that we can set an example, a set of how the things can be done. This, let's remember that this paper is not only about the 10% of strict protection, but also about the 30%, how to achieve it. And again, there, the rest of the world will need to also achieve that target. We can help in providing some ideas or signing in some directions how to get there. Okay, thanks. I think there's also a question here, which is also an interesting one, um, which is about the urgent support to protect drinking water areas that are not always integrated or classified as protected areas. Uh, does this, uh, maybe a question to Nicola, does this bring us back to the issue of other uh, area-based um, measures? I mean, it, it, could we imagine something like that where uh, the protection of specific areas designated for drinking water purposes could also then fit into the definition? Uh, yes, Natalie, absolutely. And uh, in fact, uh, under the Water Framework Directive, member states um, are supposed to develop um, a, a sort of register of protected areas uh, which uh, um, are protected uh, in order to benefit the water ecosystems. And among those, uh, also uh, drinking water abstraction area. And uh, while maybe the, the purpose, uh, the primary purpose may not be uh, specific conservation of uh, an aquatic ecosystem, but more focused on the resource, in reality, the two, they cannot be distinguished because in order to protect the resource, you need to protect the aquatic ecosystem. And so it's absolutely uh, possible, in my view, to consider these kind of areas uh, and count them against uh, the targets. And then there are two questions that both uh, link to marine uh, protection. Um, the first one is really about uh, whether we're going to be prohibiting offshore drilling in protected areas at sea, of course. And then another one is how the 30% will be calculated from marine protected areas. And I don't know whether it's possible to somehow take these two together in the interest of time also. And again, maybe I'm looking to you uh, again, Nicola, um, to tackle these two. 
Yes, of, of course, um, there are plenty of jurisdictional uh, discussions and even conflict even between member states in terms of the marine areas under their jurisdictions. Uh, this is typical for the marine environments. Uh, uh, but that said, of course, uh, member states do have uh, uh, jurisdiction over certain areas they report on. They apply the principle of the UN Law of the Sea Convention. And so that is the reference uh, base upon which uh, uh, we would calculate uh, the 30% of the areas uh, uh, which are uh, within the, um, uh, the jurisdiction of the member states at sea. And um, then in terms of whether it is possible to allow offshore drilling in protected areas, well, that depends very much on what you want to protect in those areas. There may be um, uh, activities that are incompatible with uh, uh, offshore drill, uh, sorry, offshore drilling may be incompatible with the conservation objectives uh, uh, of the site. And in that case, uh, it can uh, not be allowed. But in other cases, maybe the sites are also big enough and if natural fish that you want to protect, uh, can we withstand such an activity and therefore it would be possible uh, for this to take place. For instance, if we are talking about street protection, I would imagine this as an activity that would not be allowed. Thanks. And then maybe one final uh, question that I would call attention to here is about green infrastructure and how green infrastructure would be included um, in this initiative to increase the surface of uh, uh, protected areas. And, and if I can turn maybe to Katarina, since Katarina, you were referring to Slovakia's um, Green Slovakia strategy, I believe. Um, and I wondered whether green infrastructure is also part of your strategy and how that fits in, in your view. Uh, to what we're talking about here today. Would you be able to comment on that? Okay, thank you, Natalie, for the last comment. Uh, yes, uh, exactly the uh, part of uh, the whole structure, um, green infrastructure is really a uh, substantial part. Actually, in Slovakia, we use a kind of ecological systems uh, networking uh, for many years, but of course, the um, meaningful or, or uh, the limits uh, or the way how it's uh, used during the planning and for the uh, decision making, uh, it's uh, uh, changing in time and therefore we would like to really improve and uh, to have much uh, stronger protection and uh, to increase uh, the this uh, level of uh, uh, connectivity in uh, um, by you know, corridors in the landscape and uh, to to connect protected areas with uh, other important sites and including of course uh, the, um, the uh, cities uh, area and the infrastructure with, which uh, has really an uh, adaptable uh, meaning also if we are speaking adaptation adaptation to climate change and other issues we are facing right now so definitely as I mentioned that connectivity should be one important element which includes not only connectivity of protected areas but I think out of the protected areas to the landscape to agricultural land and to other features which are also uh, key elements and goals for a for, uh, uh, stable and, and well-being nature and, and biodiversity in the large scale so uh, just maybe one comment to uh, uh, involvement of stakeholders also based on our experience. I'm sorry, I, Katarina, I'm sorry to interrupt you because I'm, I'm getting messages to say that we absolutely have to stop the session because I believe that another session is starting uh, very soon, in fact now. So I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Um, it was very interesting to hear from all of you, uh, all the, the panelists. I want to thank everyone uh, for, for, well, for having taken part in this discussion and also all of those who participated. We had, I think, over 250 participants at any given moment, close to 300 sometimes so I think it's been very successful and uh, this is not the end of the discussion it's really the beginning uh, so I want to wish you all uh, a very nice rest of the morning and a good green week um, continuation so thanks very much to all and goodbye and sorry for cutting this short thank you very much bye thank you and bye bye thank you bye, thank you. bye, -bye.